this is the Six Sigma Green Belt training course uh, that's conducted here. There's four trainings. The last one is uh, kind of a review of the first three. So anything that you're, you're feeling like, ah, we missed out, we're not going to cover like everything that's in, in the book. There's a lot of different analyses and things in the book um, that we'll use in the next two trainings. But I just, just to introduce them so you kind of know that they're there um, kind of a thing. So that fourth one we'll get in. We'll just kind of do a review of everything, give you guys a chance to say, hey, show me that or show me an application of this. So it'll be kind of a lot of show me stuff in the last one. Um, but this one today, we'll just kind of get into what Six Sigma is, what's different from it than Lean, you know, how the two are separated, and kind of walk you through like a, a simple analysis of starting out with a lot of information and how to do what they call a drill down to get down to the root cause of stuff. And really, and that's what Six Sigma is about. The literal translation of it is variance reduction is I'm looking at a range, like we know we have to be within plus or minus whatever as a specification. Well, that's a range. So what so often happens is we go to measure something and say, I need to be at this target. And we waste all this time trying to get on that target instead of thinking about, well, I just need to be within a range. I don't need to be dead on all the time. So how much energy is spent trying to hit the target when the customer just says hit the range? So it's really just about trying to figure out where that range is and how do I detect when I'm leaving the range instead of when I'm off target. So uh, we'll play with catapults a little bit and kind of show you what range is about. So quick introductions, me, um, Brent Wickers, been here just over three years now. Um, the Lean Six Sigma Master Black Belt for all of our load. We're going to talk about the seven wastes a little bit. For those of you that have been in some of the other trainings, um, I hammer on this point constantly because it's the biggest thing about Lean and Six Sigma is the seven wastes and the things that we're chasing after. Um, always Easiest way to always remember it is it's Tim Wood. is the seven wastes, T for transportation. Anytime we're moving things around or moving ourselves around, you know, constantly moving things around is transportation waste. Uh, inventory, too much, too little. Too much is money and it causes us to move it around, which causes transportation waste. Too little inventory causes us to rush ship things in and plus we're, we don't have the parts we need to make the product. Uh, motion is human motion. Anytime we're having to move things around, physically move things out of our way. The biggest chunk of, of motion waste is usually, especially for us here, is look waste, which sounds kind of funny because we're a blind organization, but the amount of time you spend looking for your tools can be as high as 20%. So it's supposed to be here, you know, that's that's why we, we, go, we spend so much time with 5S and organizing everything to the point where everything's laid in foam, everything that I, you know, everything that I use on a regular basis is laid out in a piece of foam. I've got it up here down below. We're moving more and more of that down to the shop floor. Uh, we're about to try something different with 5S downstairs because the foam gets dirty and sometimes it's just kind of wearing out fairly quick. Uh, so we're going to start laser cutting the shapes of the tools and gluing them to the pegboard. So you can still have a shadow board, but you've got a tactile shadow board. So we're going to try something a little different with that. But still, just trying to eliminate the looking waste is really big. Waiting, anytime you're waiting for the process ahead or by, you're waiting for paperwork. Uh, Over-processing causes a lot of that weight waste because i got to get three sign-offs before I spend 20 bucks. Uh, so I, you go and get an authorization to spend a certain amount of money with a no questions asked. That eliminates a lot of that sign-offs. I think the biggest sign-off waste for us here is the work orders. How many sign-offs and stamps and initials and I mean it's it's stuff that the customer pays for in, in a lot of cases. They demand they pay us a lot of money for the part, but they pay even more for the paperwork to go with the part. So we have to we kind of look at it like that's part of the the, the demand of the customer is producing the paperwork to go along with the part. We'll have a real simple part that probably costs us 25 cents, but we have $200 involved in the paperwork to prove that we went through the processes to make the part. But there's so much stuff that 
that can be eliminated or, or made easier to, re- to remove some of that overprocessing waste. Overproduction, anytime we make more of something that, than we need. So again, we're back to, I've got inventory, I've got transportation waste because I made a bunch of parts that I might sell in the future, I might not, but I've got all this other waste involved because I ran more than I needed. And then of course, good old quality defects involves all of those. So uh, it's extremely expensive, especially when the customer is ex- expects their money back and then we have to produce the part all over again for free and then ship it to them. So it takes multiple times of making that part again just to break even. So we make one bad part, we get them their money back, we produce the part again and ship it to them. We were still losing money on that part. And it takes two or three more times just to get to the break even point where we can start making money on that part again. So it's extremely expensive to have quality defects. Uh, in the mind of most people, it's like, oh, well, I made I made the part the right way the next time and we sent it to them and we're good. And it's like, yeah, you really aren't. It, it's, it's a while before you get out of the hole. You dug a hole. Now it's going to take you a while to get out of it. So we're getting into a little bit about what problem solving is, uh, some of the problem solving identification tools. Uh, Pareto charting, What what is a true Pareto chart? It's not just a bar chart, a Pareto chart can be a little bit of all anything, but to be a Pareto chart, there's a very specific uh, piece of information it needs to have. Uh, possible cause, you know, inputs. So we'll look at what process mapping is, uh, something I developed about 10 years ago called crime scene mapping, and a cause and effect diagrams, which we've used quite often here actually, um, also known as fishbowl diagrams. And we'll look at some root cause identification tools There's a couple of them. Again, we'll just kind of look at them, but we'll use them in some other exercises that we'll do further on. So there's ranked pairs, input, output. It's just some different ways to measure all the possible things you can do to fix a root cause and which one might give you the best benefit. So instead of just randomly trying something, you can run it through these tools and (laughs) look at what your best shot is. And then we'll look at variation. So we'll we'll spend a little a uh, few minutes kind of shooting catapults at each other and seeing uh, how we can hit a target, who can hit the target best, and then measure the results, and then we'll take a shot at it again after you remove some variation. So what is a root cause? So a root cause analysis is a term used you know, to refer to uh, problem solving or structured problem solving, but a root cause analysis identifies that lowest level process. So uh, one way, easy way, um, we did at Toyota quite often uh, to get to a root cause was a real simple exercise called 5Y. And you literally just kind of put your five-year-old hat on and, and ask why five times. Why did that happen? Why, why did that happen? Oh, well, because of this. Well, why did that happen? And you just keep asking why. And you eventually get to the point where somebody says, you don't want to see where I'm going to put that cane. <laughs> <laughs> Or, okay, yeah, it's, it's because we didn't calibrate the So you end up with all these different reasons until you get to a root cause. So like I said, usually there's this obvious problem. We make some random adjustments and the problem kind of goes away. But we didn't really get down to the root cause to solve it and make sure it doesn't ever come back again. So that's kind of like a first level cause but it's not a root cause. So you really need to dig a little bit deeper, do a little more fact-based mythology to really dig into where that problem is. Uh, What you will see a lot in Lean and Six Sigma both is you will see this DI or uh, DMAIC uh, mythology, which is a define, measure, analyze, improve, and control. So that's kind of the mythology that we will go through um, especially when we're shooting catapults and trying to figure out why we're not hitting the target, is we're going to define the problem, identify it, I'm missing the target, measure it, how far off am I from the target, analyze, we're going to identify some of the probable causes of why I'm missing the target, we're going to identify some actual causes because we're going to make some improvements, do a test, and go, oh, look, that solved the problem or that didn't. So then we're going to identify those things 
and then we're going to put controls in place to make sure that those things don't pop up again. So it's all about the, it's just this mythology to say how do the inputs to the process really affect the output of the process. So within Six Sigma is two different mythologies. Most of the time, 80% of the time, you will see what they just call problem solving. I'm using the same mythology, the, D, the DMAIC mythology, to look at the problem. But for problem solving, I'm going to just use some basic tools. I'm going to do a, a quick event, and I'm going to make it a little bit better. You know, probably not perfect, but I'm just looking at a real simple issue. Now, a Six Sigma project is kind of this. You always start out with the same mythology, but you're doing more statistical tools. It's very project based and it's going to be much better and you can you can show it with statistics and it's for very complex interacting inputs and those can take like six months you can have a six month long project uh, especially for like a master black belt in six sigma you're doing something that takes six months to a year to prove out you know that i made this improvement and, and here's six months worth of data to show that i've narrowed the scope on this problem so uh, we have a few of these going at any one time here. Well, tons of these going at any one time. So, you know, what's the whole problem solving event look like? Um, I'm just gonna document my current process or problem. And this is strategic and this is value stream. So value stream is where I'm looking at the company as a whole, what's going on right now, or strategically, I can be looking at something that is going to be coming into the building or a future project. And I can, I can go and say, well, here's some problems that we know might come up. So let's document the current process or problem. Again, identify those possible causes. So you're kind of looking at a large scale view of the problem. And the tools you're going to use are going to be some input output process maps, some brainstorming. Uh, the C and E diagram, which again is this fishbone diagram that we're going to look at. So some different ways to try to identify what the problems are going to be. Analyze. You can actually identify some of the root causes and you can prioritize them. And again, you're going to use 5Y, what I just mentioned. Uh, ranked pairs and input output. Again, there's some tools that are in the back of your book that we'll, we'll uh, take a look at. And then the most common one, again, used is that cause and effect uh, tree. That will again, we'll take a look at that one here shortly. And then go ahead and design your future state. Uh, go ahead and do some countermeasure prioritization, put some mistake proofing in place, um, also known as pokey oak. You'll hear that term in lean a lot as pokey oak, which is a uh, uh, literal you know, translation of, of mistake proofing something. And then try to standardize the process. And then just kind of measure it over time. You're going to put some visual management in place. Uh, KPI is a key performance indicator, so that's just literally I'm tracking how a process is plugging along and, and reporting on it regularly. So, you know, we do a lot of KPIs here, quality on time to delivery, you know, how much money did we make last month, how much stuff did we throw away. You know, those are all KPIs that we constantly look at and see as kind of taking the temperature of the health of the company constantly. Oh yeah. When I when I think of uh, problem solving, I think of something that already exists. How do you how do you anticipate the problems? When you're ah, good, good good question. Uh, so, for instance, we've got a, pro, uh, a project we're working on right now. Uh, I can't say what the product is just yet, but it's very similar technology to what we already do in the building. It's a product that we already produce. Completely different type of product, but it's going to use the same equipment and processes. So we're looking at it and saying, well, strategically, we've had problems with our other product or that machine or that pro we've had problems with that process, or we still do. So let's look at it, you know, document the current, identify, you know. So you're kind of going through those what ifs. Um, we're actually working on uh, another tool um, that you won't see mentioned in here. Um, called a failure mode effect analysis. That's a Six Sigma tool that you can kind of look at and say, you know, failure mode would be, you know, the device over inflates and it pops. So there's the failure mode and what's the effect. 
So, well, this, this, and this would happen. So, you know, it's like, well, that would be really disastrous. So that gets moved to the top of the list and we're going to chase after that. Make sure that doesn't happen. So you can do a failure mode effect analysis on something that you haven't even made yet. You can just kind of look at it and say, what are the what are the things that cannot happen? It would be catastrophic to the customer if those things came up. So we look at those and say, okay, let's identify them and make sure they don't happen. So that that becomes your your document your current process. So the failure is the worst case, and anything else would be let would be included in mm-hmm. whatever it takes to fail. Yeah. So what we'll, we're we'll, in that case, we're in this case, we're saying, hey, the that would be like one of the worst cases is what would happen if this thing overinflated and said, well, it would, it would pop or quit working and that would be disastrous. It just, that cannot happen. I said, okay, so how do we assure that that's not going to happen? Well, here's some things we can do to make sure that that's impossible to happen. You just, you, whatever is being used to inflate it doesn't have the power to overinflate the product now because do, we made some changes. Do you use the parameters set by the customer? Also? Yes. Oh, oh yeah. So yeah. This is what in an RFP. Mm-hmm. This exactly. Is what we need, and so you're looking yeah. at those as We're, these are the process, the yeah, value yeah. streams I have. Yeah, that's 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 the the what the customer is paying for is for us to meet those specifications. But now we have to make sure. You know, what what are we doing to assure that we can't screw it up, no matter what? You know, what fail safes are we putting in place to make sure that doesn't happen? Other than it's like, oh, well, we're checking it in quality before it goes out. It's like, no, there's got to be fail safes in the manufacturing process to stop that from happening. So, some problem identification tools. Um, so, again, a problem is anything that deviates from the standard. So the things you want to consider is your standards are like drawings, specifications, work instructions, and you set a standard. So we say, hey, the customer says that part needs to be one inch long. And we say, okay, that's the standard, but what's the variance? So, well, the difference, you know, variance is anything that's different from the standard. So we start measuring where we're going, and we said, hey, little by little, we're starting to vary from what the standard is. So there's what's really happening. That gap is the range. So the gap allows you to see the size of your problem. So as we're measuring things, as we're looking at uh, this KPI on this part, we're watching it vary up and down. Sometimes it's a little over an inch, sometimes it's a little under. And the customer says it can be plus or minus 0.1. Is that like a common? You know, usually it's 0.0001 for us, but... Yeah, <laughs> pretty tight tolerances in aerospace. But that, that gap, you have to be able to see what that gap is and look at it over time to say, hey, am I, am I seeing a trend down? Am I seeing a trend up? And when it gets to a certain point, the part's no good. But at what point do I need to be notified? You know, what, at what point does it need to trigger me into action before it gets to that, that outside point? So that's some of the tools that we're going to look at to say, yeah, I'm measuring the process, and it looks, even though it's varying up and down, it's staying within the healthy range that I don't need to worry about it, you know, staying within that one sigma range. So two considerations. We're looking at this, this specification. So can I trust the data is your first question. Is like, am I, can I trust the gauge, the way I'm measuring it? Is it trustworthy? Um, if not, <clears throat> you're doing what they call a gauge study. So you're using a caliper to measure something, and somebody else is using, you know, another set of calipers. You're getting two different numbers. So right off the bat, you you can't trust the data. So you're back to looking at your tools and your gauges to make sure it's being measured correctly. And then the other thing is, is the standard meaningful? A lot of times companies spend a ton of time trying to get that part just perfect and they come to find out the range that the part can be within is huge. And you're wasting all this time trying to get it perfect instead of just meeting the customer's specifications. So make sure the standard that you set up is the same as what the customer expects. And it, it sounds strange, but it's very I've seen that over and over and over again where we have huge amount of people in the room, an expensive amount of you know, folks in the room, you know, million dollars worth of salary in the room 
trying to figure out why we're not hitting that one inch mark, then we find out the tolerance is a tenth of an inch plus or minus, and we've been within it for years. But somebody raised a red flag and said, oh, we were over the inch and we got to fix this problem. It's not a problem. I just never was. And, it, and you said the range. So I, I, it can go up to 340 degrees, but not less than 300 degrees. And if I was trying, it's supposed to be at 325, and if I tried to keep it at 325, I'd be constantly yeah, you'd be adjusting at, and wasting time. Was wasting time on it instead of just saying, hey, is the range good? So a little bit about Pareto charting. Um, we hear the, the word Pareto quite often. It's actually, for some reason, it's kind of related directly to a bar graph. Anyone sees a bar, a bar graph in, in Excel and they say, oh, that's a Pareto chart. And it's not a Pareto analysis. Uh, where Pareto came from was actually a guy, a uh, mathematician, uh, political scientist, uh, economist. What he was best known for is being an economist. He actually introduced the concept of Pareto efficiency and he developed the field of micro microeconomics. So what he did was he was the first one to discover that income across the world follows a Pareto distribution, which is the 80-20 rule. So if, you, if you've heard of the 80-20 rule, that's where this got coined from. It's the Pareto principle was named after him and it was built on all these observations that he did, such as 80% of the land in Italy was only owned by 20% of the population. So the same as at a company is 80% of our inventory is only 20% of our part numbers. Here is actually 17%. So only 17% of our warehouse out there accounts for 80% or $8 million that we have in inventory. So everything kind of follows that general 80-20 rule. 80% 80 of our quality issues are only 20% of the things that we make. So it's like focus on the 20% to make 80% of your problem go away. So that's kind of what his, uh, what an Pareto analysis does. And he did not invent Excel. That's what I hear a lot too. Was he invented bar graphing? It's like, no, he really didn't. So a true Pareto analysis would be in, in, in this situation, we're gonna use a bar graph, but the only difference would be I've got this bar graph showing things sorted from high to low. Here's my, my how many times my problem happened. Here's my, my bar graph showing how many times that problem happened in each of these categories. It's still not a Pareto yet, but a, a good bar graph will say, yeah, here's my problem. Category one's obviously my biggest issue that I need to go chase after. It becomes a Pareto when I can look at it and say, well, how much of that is 80% of my problem? So when I can have a, a my cumulative percentage and have this cool little line or an arc that says, hey, at this point, I have 80% of my problem is there. So I'm going to go focus on the top three categories to go after 80% of my problem instead of just picking the first category and chasing after that. Well, I could chase after 80% of my problem by going after the three and there's usually some correlation in there, if not the same problem going after all three. So you're going to start to do the first one, go into the second category to start working on it and come to find out it was the same problem as the first category. So you grab 80%, 80% of your problem, and again, you're going to solve a huge amount of your issues uh, much easier that way. So. Every once in a while you see a graph like this and you see your, cumuli, your what they call your cum line here going just a straight shot up like that. So if the bars are flat, it usually means you gotta separate your categories or sort your data a different way, kind of look at it differently. This might be by date. Like here's all the problems that I've had and I'm sorting them by date and it's all flat. All that's telling you is you have the same problem month after month, same one over and over again. So it's like, that's really not telling you anything. So you just sort your data differently. It doesn't mean it's like, oh, I, I got to go measure it, something else. It's like, you might be measuring the right thing. You're just not sorting it in the, in the right method. So try sorting it by a different category or, you know, different input. 
So we'll kind of show you how that would work. Uh, this is a, um, a, a great example that I like using because it was a real life example. But this will show you kind of how the drill down in, into data actually works. So uh, you're going to start a new restaurant and we'll call it, uh, let's see, what was the name of my, my Lean Burger was my other restaurant, my other training. So Lean Burger's uh, motto is the sacred cows make the best burgers. So we're going to start this new restaurant and I put a complaint box out by the door for my customers on the way out. And right off the bat, after a few months of time, my number one complaint by far was beverage. Uh, vegetables was next, salad, and then it kind of dropped off after that. But uh, beverage and uh, vegetables were 80% of my complaints. So it's like I got just two, two categories that are 80% of my complaints. Um, so, so far, what do we see? 80%, I've got beverages and vegetables, and then it kind of drops off drastically. But, uh, but does that give you any action? Does that help you make a decision as far as what to go do next? There's really, there was really no info, not enough information yet to say, well, I'm going to go chase after beverages, but it's a restaurant. I've got 30 different beverages I serve. So it doesn't give you enough information yet. So you will do a drill down and keep going until you've got data that says, now I got action. That's telling me to go do something. Right now, it's not telling you anything. So we'll do a, what's called a second level drill down. So we're going to take beverages. This is our beverage complaints, and we broke it out. So now I'm looking at coffee, water, tea, and then all of a sudden soft drinks, wine, and liquor kind of trail off. So again, over 80% of my issues, I mean 90% of my issues, is coffee, water, tea. So it's like, okay, I'm getting a little better information now. It still might not be driving me to action, but I'm getting closer. So I've, I've eliminated soft drinks, wine, and liquor, because those are the things I just buy in a bottle and I serve them. Coffee, water, tea is stuff that I make, or I, I, you know, I handle that myself. So something's going on within my restaurant. It's not my suppliers. Something's going on within my, my restaurant because I control those things. Still not quite there. So we're going to do a third level breakdown, a third level dive. So now I'm looking at, I took my coffee complaints, which was my number one at my second level, and I split those up, coffee, you know, regular decaf, and they're about the same. They're kind of flat. So again, it's not quite the way I should be sorting the data. So I split coffee that way. It's not telling me anything. It's flat. Now I'm looking at my tap water versus my bottled water because that was my second complaint. And woo, all my complaints are my tap water and just a couple coming out of my bottled water. And then my third category on that breakdown was iced tea versus hot tea. Again, I'm flat. So what did you see in all of that? Water. <laughs> yeah, water is tap water is bad. So coffee, whether it was decaf or not, which I don't understand anyone drink decaf, but it's like, what's the point? Decaf, no fat, latte <laughs> with sprinkles. Um, coffee was flat complaint between decaf and regular. I, hot tea, iced tea was the same. You know, it didn't matter. But yeah, tap water. So then you started looking at it. You know, your next investigation is going to be, well, how if tap water is my big complaint, what else does my tap water go into? If I'm using, in a restaurant, you're using your tap water on everything. So if I just went after that very first bar and that very first complaint beverages, I might not be in, getting deep enough into the problem to find out that, hey, I'm, my tap water is getting into a little bit of everything on my menu. Is, is, is the correlation between the, the top problem areas with coffee water, is it strong enough that when you start to drill down that you would use, well, what's my next problem area? What's my next oh, area yes, as true. a way of drilling down? Yeah, so, in this, so to look at it this way, there's beverages. So I took beverages and broke it down into my second level. 
And then I took each one of those top three and broke each one of those down. And then of those, lo and behold, which one, yeah, where, which one has the greatest variance? Ooh, right there. So with that, so, so, you know, what would your last Pareto look like? So I found out that tap water is my, my biggest complaint or my biggest variance because between that and bottled water, I got this huge variance. So there's my, my biggest number of complaints out of all of that. So now if I go back and look at that number one Pareto analysis that had all my other complaints in it, uh, and I know water, so what's my next analysis? Yeah, how much stuff does my water touch? So I look at that and say, well, tap water is a common ingredient. Uh, here's my total number of complaints. So my beverages, veggies, salad, my appetizers, all the way down to potatoes. Those are all of my complaints that involve tap water, 98%. So I'm hitting 98% on my problem by figuring out why my tap water is so bad. Which is, uh, where was that, Detroit? Who had all that super... Yeah, was that, was that old Flint? Yeah, Flint, Michigan. So if this was a Flint, Michigan restaurant, it'd be really easy to figure out your problem. But that, so uh, what they did with this information is they, they went and bought one of those, you know, filters. The tap water just happened to be really lousy where this, in this part of the country. And they just put some filters on their tap water and then poof, all those complaints went away, or most of them went away. But again, if, if they just started out at that very first complaint, which was just beverages, and it's like, oh, well, maybe it's, you know, I need to switch from Coke to Pepsi, or I need to do change my brand of coffee, and it's just doing all these trial and error things instead of taking the time to break the analysis down and try to figure out where, where it really is. And, and then it's like, okay, the next thing is vegetables. Maybe I need to get different vegetables or buy from a different farm. So you, you waste all of that time, but doing this analysis, they found out, hey, I can just use a water filter. And that fixes 98% of my complaints. So some other different ways to look at a problem is process mapping. And process mapping is literally just drawing out a map of the different processes. Now the different boxes, the different shapes actually mean different things. Uh, of course the diamond shape is always that de uh, decision. It can go yes, no, maybe, you know, a couple different directions. Um, squares and rectangles are usually a, a, a change in department. The big rectangles are usually a process of some sort. So you go to draw out a process map and everybody likes to do a process map while you're in the room, you're in a conference room and you're like, yeah, yeah, it's like this. And then you go walk the floor and you find out, no, it's actually like that. And so whenever you do a process map, always do it at what they call at, at Gimba. You do it on the floor and you start at the end process and work your way back up instead of front to, to end. Do it front to end, you end, usually end up with this because people are going to say, well, yeah, yeah, next I'm supposed to give it to Kevin. And it's like, well, if you do it from reverse, go from shipping back up the chain, you can say, well, who gave this to you? And it's like, oh, well, actually, I got it from Dino. And then we go talk to Dino and he goes, oh, well, actually, I got this from Lucy. And then Lucy says, I got it from Kevin. So you're missing a couple processes in between when you do it from front to back. So you find out your process is actually like that, and it actually should be you know, fairly straightforward. So you really want to make sure you document reality and not what's already documented in a procedure somewhere. So go walk the floor. So here's a, a macro level process map. You know, put some water in the coffee maker, put the grounds in it, turn it on, stand back. Uh, really high level, but the problem is, is it doesn't identify why or where uh, there might be a problem. So if I gave you those directions and put you in front of our coffee maker in the lunchroom, it's not really enough information to tell you how to operate the thing. And if, if, you're, if something went wrong, then you would say, well, where did it go wrong at? more than likely you're not going to be able to point at a pro this process map and say, well, that's where it went wrong. So, and actually this is a real, this was at BoxMaker. I had to do this because our engineers, as brilliant as they were at making a package 
that I could drop off a three-story building and not break the egg inside of it. They couldn't operate a coffee maker and remember to put the coffee pot under the thing before they turned it on. So we, I, we forced them to go through this exercise of what a process map is. So we said, this is not happening. So we made them draw out this process map. So now I've got enough information that I could look at this and say, oh yeah, step by step, as long as I do these, each one of these steps, I can make a pot of coffee and not make a huge puddle on the floor of coffee and assure that I'm doing it the right way. So now I can identify when something goes wrong, I can point at it and say, that's where the problem happens. So this is hanging up on the wall uh, next, to the, next to the Sunbeam Mr. Coffee machine. And what we would do with these guys, uh, besides doing the, we, we kind of identified, you know, what are the inputs, what are the outputs to each one of those steps, is we actually made what we call um, a crime scene map. So the crime scene map was, we're looking at, you know, the controllables, the standards and things that are noise. You want to try to make as many of those steps or process steps as controllables, which are things that is like, I can only do it one way. I've got a, a I flip a lever, it's automatic. Um, I can only turn the lever so far and it stops me. So those are controllables versus standard operating procedures, which is I'm told to do it this certain way, but I don't have to. Nothing's forcing me to do that. I can do whatever I want but the operating procedure says to do it. So that's not a really good control. And then noise is literally things that you don't, you can't control at all. So I can't control, you know, in this case, we couldn't control who was going to come in there and make coffee. Could have been anybody. So we had to deal with, how do you deal with the noise, which could be anybody. So again, we had to look at outputs. Uh, what are all the different inputs that affect it? And then we came up with what we call crime scene mapping to help help clarify all of that. So it's kind of an aid to make where the problem was happening happening a little more clear. And why did we do it? It kind of helps the team focus on where the problem actually was. You know, identify why it's happening. So it's a, using a process map or an area layout, and we would add dots for each of the failures of when it happened. So it can also be, the DOS can also be used to show the number of defects on the part. So what we did with that process map is we actually started putting dots every time somebody forgot to load the basket with coffee in it. They just filled the coffee carafe with hot water. We put a dot on there to say, well, that's where the failure is happening. That's where the failure is happening. So that's one way to look at it. You can look at it on a layout. So we've got a cell down there that's producing a part, and there was a bunch of failures on that part, and there's a little red dot on the map showing where the failure happened each time. So if we did something like that here, we'd have like say all the CNC machines laid out on the floor, and we'd have a little red dot or a, a red dot with a number in it that said this is how many failures were coming from that machine. So you could look at the shop floor map and go, yeah, here's what's going on. And uh, there's a lot of software that does this now, too. So as you guys are updating, you know, data or, you know, doing NCRs and those sorts of things, uh, non-conforming reports, it starts looking at it and saying, well, where was the failure at? Well, it was at machine seven. And then the number would go up on machine seven on the process map. And then uh, Boeing actually uses this process a lot is uh, the crime scene map where they have quality issues on the aircraft during assembly. So you go up to do your part of the install on, the, on an aircraft as it's going down the line, you notice a quality problem, it gets reported and then it goes back on that red dot. So when the aircraft is done going through the process of assembly, they can look at that and say, oh, well, whatever department that is, we found this many errors. So it's, again, it's out there visual, everyone can see it. So you try really hard not to make a mistake because it's gonna get put on a crime scene map you know, with your department's name on it. And then uh, cause and effect diagram is another probable cause uh, identification tool. Um, 
used to identify and kind of organize some possible causes. And it's kind of a way to visually lay it out. Um, it helps with filtered brainstorming, uh, kind of graphically illustrates where a problem's at, kind of helps you investigate the problem's origins a little bit. And then it kind of does, uh, it kind of organizes the cause and effect links. So what it does with the brainstorming is, for so many people, brainstorming is really difficult when we just say, hey guys, just shout out your thoughts. One or two people are usually pretty good about it. The rest are usually pretty quiet or they don't want to, you know, my idea might be stupid, so I don't want to say anything. So what happens with a cause and effect diagram is everybody gets post-it notes and you just start writing ideas down as fast as you can. And it just turn them into me, you go up and post them up on the wall, you're not having to verbalize anything, but you're just sticking them up on the wall. So people usually get a lot more ideas out that way. So the way the cause and effect diagram works, and you can see why they call it a fishbone, is the head of the fish is the effect or your problem that you're having. And you break it down into different categories. And the categories could be man, machine, method, you know, uh, environmental, you know, weather causes the problem. So you come up with what the different categories may be, and then you start brainstorming these ideas and say, well, I got, this is what I think might be causing the problem, and it's, it's man-caused, and that's where you would, what category you'd put it under. So in this one, I'd say, wow, most of the ideas came up around this category, so let's kind of see which ones are, are alike from everybody that brainstormed it, and then go chase after that one, because the consensus of the room is that that might be the main, the main cause to the problem. So in this example, I got excess inventory, you know, why do I have excess inventory? I, I got it broken down into some categories, people, material, measurement, the market, uh, machines. So I got all these different categories. And again, we started brainstorming ideas. Um, I like, uh, it used to be done where people just went up and wrote stuff on the wall, um, which makes it really hard when you say, well, actually that one should be over here on the market side. Well, now you're, you've are you already written it on there. Post-it notes, you can just move them around. So access, can, access inventory was the one on the bottom right. Yeah, so that, well, yeah, so saying my problem is I got excess inventory. Why did that happen? And it's like, well, people, you know, there was manufacturing delays, uh, duplicate parts was, you know, a probable cause. So you identify, you know, just define what the effect or the problem is, define the categories that you think make sense, and then start brainstorming, and then categorize the causes, move them, you know, then you can kind of move them into this C and E diagram. But everybody's just sitting there feverishly writing down and then saying, well, that one's this, and I think that's materials, and I set it aside here, uh, and just kind of go through this process. So it's just kind of a, a neat way to do brainstorming and get as many ideas out of the group as, as you can without saying, hey, Kevin, why don't you give us your seven ideas and stand up and in front of the room. <laughs> and people just go, I don't have any. And you might have the best idea out there. You just don't want to say it. There we go. So it can be done for production processes, service processes. You just got your categories are probably going to be a little bit different. Um, but again, you can do this for any, uh, any type of uh, business. And then so we have went through a process map. We went through some cause and effects. We have some ideas of what we want to go do. So how do we rank those? It's like I got, I got 17 things to go work on that seem likely to go fix that problem. But now I need to do some root cause identification, kind of filter some of those out to say which one's probably gonna give me the biggest bang for the buck. Because I've got limited resources, I could probably work on the top three. But, but are, which ones are the top three? So a couple different tools out there that you can use. And again, we'll use, we'll literally use them in the, in the next couple of trainings. But some of the tools that are out there to be able to identify root cause is you need to know, again, has the problem been identified? Is the scope appropriate for what I'm gonna do or the event? And have I identified the possible inputs? So what the root cause identification tool called Ranked Pairs does 
is it starts comparing one probable fix with another probable fix and kind of let, uh, let you decide, well, I think that one's better than that one. Well, how does that compare to the next one and the next one? Which can be a real, you know, a real long drawn out process. But by using this tool, it allows you to filter them out very quickly. But it actually creates a chart, a chart and kind of lays them out for you to say, well, it seems like everybody in the room thinks that one's going to give us the best bang for the buck. So kind of how it works when you're, when you're handwriting it out is you've got, in this case, I've got my coffees and I got bad coffee. So what am I going to go to do? What experiments am I going to try to fix it? Well, I've, I've got, here's the five things I think is going wrong. I repeat it, repeat the list up above it. And then I have a quick little matrix that I go through and draw this up. So again, the first half of them I'm going to eliminate because they're repeats. Yeah, you know, they don't make any sense or duplicates. So you really only have this small little section to go through and say, well, between copy type and copy brand, which one do I think has the most effect on my bad coffee? So you pick one. Then you go to the next two, go to these three, these four. And when you're all done, you add up how many times you circled number one. How many times did you circle number two? And then you're going to report on, well, I, I have number one as the, the biggest one. And then John's going to say, well, I had number two this many times. And so even, the, you know, that, that allows you, as a group, everybody gets to have some input and say, well, here's what I think we're going to go work on, because most everybody ended up picking number one as the most likely cause. Uh, the way we will use the tool is electronically. I have uh, a setup to where each individual just goes in and clicks on it. You literally go up to the voting booth and just go, I'm picking this, 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 and this, and walk away. The next person comes up and picks. So it's like you're not even having to stand up or, or say anything. The system will allow each person to come up and vote. And then when it's all said and done, uh, instead of having to count the votes out, you end up with a nice little graphed out chart that tells you where to go, what to do.